Coming up on today's show, Elon Musk says he'll spend 24-7 at the factory. Chatamo 2 allows for charging up to 400 kilowatts. And which member of the royal family here in the UK wants an EV? Well, hello and welcome to the Sunday, the 17th of June edition of EV News Daily. It's Martin Lee here with the news you need to know about electric cars and the move towards sustainable transport. And we'll start with a tweet that's only a few hours old. It was only a month ago that we heard the details of the dual motor and the much more expensive performance versions of the Model 3 from Tesla, or as they seem to be called these days, the 3D and the P3D. Well, yesterday, Elon Musk revealed the very first Model 3, just rolled off the new assembly line at the Fremont factory. And when I say he revealed, of course he tweeted, and when I say Fremont factory, I mean very large semi-permanent tent. Uh, there are some photos flying around online which have been taken of the Fremont facility uh, with a few weeks in between. And you can clearly see this new part that's being built out for this new assembly line for the Model 3. And from a, a long distance of Above looks like it's either from a it's more than a drone height it looks like it's it's higher than that uh, it, it it's a large area when you see the photos up close it's just a very very large tense and he tweeted Elon tweeted a picture of a performance model and we know that because we can see the red brake calipers and whilst it's not a really clear photo you can make out the white interior as well now both are only options and both only appearing for now rather on the performance version of the Model 3, the P3D. It's once again the specs on that 310 miles range on the battery, 0 to 60 in 3.5 seconds, top speed limited to 155. It, I reckon it could go so much quicker. And a price tag, yeah, it's not a cheap one, $78,000 if you don't opt for autopilot. And by the way, uh, one of the big online fans of Tesla and one of the great podcasts out there, Ryan McCaffrey, who makes the weekly unofficial Tesla podcast and has been having a, a bit of to and fro with Elon on Twitter over the last few weeks, actually. He's had a bit of a direct line to the boss. Uh, he's His spec, if you listen to his podcast as well, his spec is exactly the same as the Model 3, which was pictured by Elon Musk. Now, one of his listeners picked up on that and replied to Musk's tweet and said, that's not DMC Ryan's Model 3, is it? And Elon replied to that in the affirmative. Now, was he being tongue-in-cheek or was he serious? We'll find out, but very exciting for anybody who's been in the configurator, got the performance model. Uh, there is now a third line at Fremont ready to go, ready to hit that 5,000 models a week. Well, an email sent to all Tesla staff from Elon Musk just two nights ago uh, congratulated employees for the progress they've made on the Model 3 vehicle production recently, but also said radical improvements are needed in manufacturing to hit the company's quarterly targets. According to CNBC, it also references a, nam a man named Omid, or Omid, presumably Omid Af. Shah, I think that's how I say his name. I hope I've got that correctly. He's a project manager in the office of the CEO at Tesla. Well, here's Elon's email in full, which was leaked to the news organization. And I quote, it's getting very exciting. All parts of the Model 3 production system are now above 500 and some are almost at 700 cars already. Congratulations to all on making such progress. That said, radical improvements are still needed in paint shop output GA3. I'll just jump in here and say that is General Assembly 3, by the way. Right, back to the email. Uh, bringing up the new GA4 end of line and module zone 4 at Giga. We also need to achieve sustained 700 plus per week on the body line. Wherever you are in the company, if you feel you can help out in any of these areas, please check in with Jat at GA on GA3 and Jerome Gillen on GA4 and Omid on EOL and JB Straubel or Chris Lister on Module Zone 4. I will be at our Fremont factory almost 24-7 for the next several days, checking in with those groups to make sure they have as many resources as they can handle. Thanks, Elon. Uh, that's the end of the email. I always find it interesting to give you those emails in full because this is such a critical time. Although I must say that the 5,000 Model 3s per week is a self-imposed deadline, but if they miss it, they will be taken to task as if they've missed some holy grail of a deadline. 
Will they hit it? He's talking radical improvements. On the other hand, a couple of weeks to go and putting pictures online of performance models. It's, I don't know. It's in the balance. 50-50. We'll wait and see. Well, moving on to charging your car. Now, a while ago on the podcast, I was talking to you about the new specs for Chatamo and the draft specs which were flying around. Now it looks like those draft specifications have been ratified officially. It's Chatamo 2.0, and Electrive reports that the system allows for charging capacities up to 400 kilowatts and allows for charging up to 1,000 volts with liquid-cooled cables without changing plugs and using the current connectors. That is key. Uh, well, Chatamo 2.0 also opens the door to fast charging for larger EVs. We're thinking things like trucks and buses. And the main benefit compared to the CCS system remains. The Japanese DC charging system is V2G capable. Furthermore, the new Chatamo technology is compatible with plug and charge functionalities, allowing for automated authentication and payment. And I'll put a full link to the Electrive article in the show notes. We'll come back in a moment to Japanese V2G plans. But first of all, the Prince of Wales, uh, the Queen's son, is preparing to add uh, at least one and maybe more electric car to the Royal Fleet after making friends with Kimball Musk. Uh, according to the Daily Mail in the UK, whilst hosting the multinationals board member uh, Kimball Musk uh, here in the UK and his fiance at Dumfries House up in Scotland. Prince Charles, according to the article, had a test drive and he test drove a black Tesla Model S uh, specced to around £75,000, about $90,000, I guess. And now he wants to make the royal family's car collection more eco-friendly by including an EV. Well, Clarence House, uh, which is how they communicate from the office of Prince Charles, if you like, uh, the Prince of Wales. Clarence House told the Daily Telegraph newspaper, there is definitely a plan for us to incorporate electric cars into the royal fleet, end quote. Well, there's a couple of things that happened recently. First of all, uh, the Prince of Wales was seen turning up at, ooh, was it a, oh, was it a science fair? He turned up at something. Maybe there was the Science Museum in London inside the new Jaguar I-Pace, and he jumped out of that. It was the first time I'd seen the I-Pace actually on public roads, and a great coup for Jaguar's PR to get him in that. And then a few weeks later, of course, it was the big royal wedding, Meghan Markle, and uh, jumping inside that Jaguar E-Type as Prince Harry drove off in the converted uh, Jaguar E-Type worth about £250,000. It's a one-off. And those two events make me think that Jaguar, who hold the royal warrant, by the way, to supply cars to the royal family, will be first in line. I know he's met Kimball. I know he's driven a Tesla. But I would still put all of the chips on them having Jaguar I-Paces in the royal fleet. I wouldn't be surprised if that's already been arranged. It won't be Tesla's. It will be Jaguar's. Uh, they're, of, they're, I mean, they're owned by the Indian Tata company. The I-Paces are made <laughs> by Magna outside the country in Austria. But still, it's a Jag. And I do think that there is no other car I can see them adding uh, to the Royal Fleet. I wouldn't be surprised if a few of those Jag I-Paces are seen ferrying members of the Royal Family around. Well, moving on, and the next-gen Nissan Qashqai, which is going to be due in showrooms about 2020, going to feature two new hybrid systems, along with a really sleek design makeover. Auto Express has exclusively, exclusively revealed, however, there won't be a pure electric version of the Qashqai, whilst Nissan's also considering ditching diesel from the UK's third best-selling car, AutoExpress.co.uk, report that full electric power is going to be reserved for a completely separate SUV based on this all-new platform. They won't be doing it to the Qashqai. It's likely to underpin the whole new family of EVs, spanning the B segment, C segment, D segment. That's everything from the Nissan Duke up to the Nissan X-Trail uh, for Nissan and its alliance partners, of course, those being Renault and Mitsubishi. And I'll put a link to the Auto Express article in the show notes. Well, staying with Nissan and Mark Kane at Inside EVs has picked up on a story where Nissan's announced a new partnership concerning V to G services and renewable energy products with the energy supplier Eon. And this comes back to the earlier story 
Chatamo being bi-directional, G being a really big opportunity and something that the Chatamo connector can do. And of course, Nissan wanting to push that as well. Nissan looking like they want to be an energy company. A bit like Tesla, not just an automaker, but lots of different facets to their business with business units around renewable energy generation. Of course, they're getting into solar energy storage systems. Of course, they're getting into fixed storage, V to G systems and grid integration. Now, Nissan say, and I quote, Nissan uses its vehicle to grid tech to achieve this. It's a key element of intelligent integration. They continue by saying one of the three central pillars of the Nissan Intelligent Mobility Vision. The partnership with E.ON is going to utilize a V2G infrastructure and Nissan's advanced bi-directional charging tech. It will also allow customers to draw energy from the grid to power their EVs. They can also sell the energy back to the grid for others to use at peak times. It could represent a net no cost to the customer and drive for free. Well, staying with Nissan, by the way, and Green Car Reports has an update on this 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf battery issue. In March, we told you about a study of a small group of 2016-17 Nissan Leaf models equipped with the larger 30 kilowatt hour battery pack that had some really abnormal battery degradation. Now, that study happened to conclude that nearly four out of five of the larger battery packs examined lost cell capacity three times faster than the smaller original 24 size battery pack. Now, this week, Nissan said it would issue a software update for the battery controllers to help stem any power loss. The software fix, according to Green Car Reports, was reported by the Clean Fleet report, and according to the report, the software fix addresses a known issue. So they've been dealing with this about the controller. Now, the controller's been miscalculating the available range and charge from the battery. Initially, while some suspected that the Leaf's air cooling for its batteries rather than liquid cooling was to blame for the reduced capacity and higher deg, the study in March didn't observe the redesigned 2018 Nissan Leafs battery pack, which was upgraded to the third and larger size 40 kilowatt hour. So if that affects you, if you've had the letter from Nissan, uh, and I've got the letter here, and I won't read the whole thing out because probably only, only of interest to a small group of Leaf owners who might listen to this podcast. Um, uh, let me know. Get in touch. Have you Has yours gone back yet? Is yours? Have you got the letter? Are you booking it in? Uh, let me know either on the uh, YouTube comments, the blog comments, or you can do it on the socials. Well, let's get into the community section of the podcast today. And today we're going to talk about the topic of chargers being in use when you need to use them. Now, Darren S., uh, on Twitter, who is the Hull Leaf guy, got in contact for this topic of discussion uh, with this. Hi, Martin. Craig and myself both had charging etiquette issues today. A good topic for the comments section of your podcast, question mark. And I completely agree, uh, Darren. So what happened? Uh, well, first of all, somebody else on uh, Twitter who I follow, Craig, got iced. We'll call it iced by a non charging i3 and we can call it iced because it's the range extender that was blocking the charging bay and then darren says myself and jules were frustrated by a nissan leaf driver plugged in at 97 percent and wouldn't unplug for us so here's the question today then maybe you want to chip in with this on the comments or on the socials or reply on twitter what do you think when you get to 97 percent should you just unplug it and what do you do I mean, if you get iced by a combustion car, you kind of roll your eyes and go, holy moly, when are they going to learn? But when it's done by a fellow EV owner, just using the parking space because the parking space is free and not plugging in, well, that is a bit... That, is a, that does take the biscuit, doesn't it? It's a bit of a kick in the old man sack because it really hurts when a fellow e driver who know, EV driver who knows better is just using the car parking space. Is it the signage which is wrong? I've seen plenty of EV charging bays which says electric cars only and i've seen some others which say electric car charging only and i know it is subtle but it's a subtle message to say look unless you're charging this space isn't for you and it also really sucks in a car park that has lots of free spaces now 
What are the ways around this? I'd love to hear from you. Leave a comment. How would you fix this problem? One of the things I've been saying for ages, put EV charging bays as far away from the place people are getting to as possible. So at the moment, with big supermarkets, big retail stores, when they put two or three charging bays in, they do it right next to the front door, next to the disabled bays and the, you know, the mother and child or the father and child spaces with the extra wide bits for the doors because you've got kids in the back of the car. Put them at the far end of the car park. Other people would say that's not safe because uh, it makes you more of a, a risk to have someone attack you or something if you're in a deserted car park. But nobody wants those spaces. Nobody wants to walk to the store. I don't care. If it means you can always get a parking space to charge your car, it's a it's a 20 second walk in most cases. On the other hand, there is increased costs because you've got to dig up more of the car park, lay more cable if you're going to put it in the middle of nowhere, the spaces that nobody wants rather than the spaces by the front door. Do we need some sort of technology where when all EVs get to 80% state of charge, which is when the charge rates really drop off for nearly all of the uh, different EVs that are on the market right now, uh, that the connectors in some way unlock? And that as soon as it gets to 80%, you can take the plug out of somebody else's car and plug it into your own one because it's just going to trickle charge after that. Or do you not want somebody touching your car and potentially damaging it? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to know. Well, thank you so much for listening today. You can listen to every previous episode of the podcast. They're online. They always will be. And they'll be free forever on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio Podcasts, and of course, the good old blog, evnewsdaily.com if you want to subscribe on any of those platforms feel free be my guest you get them first and free and automatically and if you want to leave a little review on your favorite platform you know how much it helps if you want to come and say hi on the socials just search ev news daily and you'll find me have a wonderful day and i'll catch you tomorrow